Greetings from the Vardy community in Hancock County, named for the Melungeon Patriarch Vardaman Collins and home to the legendary Melungeon moonshiner Mahala Mullins. Here, visitors can tour Big Haley's log cabin home where the sheriff charged with bringing her to justice made the famous proclamation, she's catchable, but she ain't fetchable, in reference to the moonshiner's large size. Big Haley was so large she couldn't pass through the cabin's doors, and upon her death, a stone fireplace and chimney had to be dismantled in order to remove her body for burial. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Phil Acre Cavalier, and I'm the provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs at the University of Tennessee Martin and the host for this afternoon's session. Thanks for joining us virtually for this conversation with Ann Height and Carter Sickles at the Southern Festival of Books. I want to welcome everyone on behalf of Humanities Tennessee. The festival is a free nonprofit event that is supported in part by no donations from individuals. If you appreciate the event and want to support it, you can do so by visiting our website at www.humtn.org. We'll post the link to the donate page as well. For those of you watching on Facebook Live or YouTube who want to ask questions during the session, please either download the festival app or visit the streaming site via the link at www.humtn.org backslash SFB. We want to thank our bookseller, Parnassus Books of Nashville. Purchase of these books uh, that you make via Parnassus help keep the festival free. Humanities Tennessee staff will place the book buy links for that session at the top of the chat. The festival is a free nonprofit event that is support, supported in part by donations from individuals. We ask you to please donate if you feel like you appreciate this session. I'm excited to start this conversation this afternoon with Ann Height and Carter Sickles about their two books, uh, Roll the Stone Away and The Prettiest Star. Ann Height's debut novel, Ghost on Black Mountain, won Georgia Author of the Year and was shortlisted for the Townsend Prize in 2012 three times nominated for Pushcart Prize, uh, and was three times nominated for the Pushcart Prize. Uh, Anne Height's fourth novel, Sleeping Above the Chaos, was also uh, awarded Georgia Author of the Year finalist and an Indie Fab finalist in 2017. Being a city girl most of her life, she now writes each day in her home office that looks out on a decent cluster of trees. So without further ado, Anne Height. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, um, I thought I would maybe read a little something and then I'd kind of talk about the book, but the reading it will kind of give you an idea of what it's about. Um, this particular portion that I'm going to, to read to you is when I was six years old, we lived in Germany and we had moved to Germany a year before we could get onto the base. And this was 1961. So th this actually takes place in 1962. And I'm five years old. The first year we lived on base, a week before Christmas Eve, Daddy huffed around, waiting on me to don rubber snow boots and layers of clothes and gloves. We tramped out of the apartment into the snow, deep enough to slide inside the top boots. I looked around, sniffing the air. I smell icicles. There is no such odor, Anne, Daddy grumbled. But I detected the clean, faintly sweet fragrance that only icicles could give. I never uttered one complaint about my cold feet, even as my toes went to tingling. Our mission? 
search out the perfect tree and bring it home. Daddy being a soldier worked at all tasks with the same dogged determination he must have used when marching to the front in World War II. Maybe right where we stood. After all, he had been part of the liberation troops that set the prisoners free from the concentration camps less than 20 years before. The forest was dense, but bright due to the snow that coated everything with pure light. I imagined that the ice crystals falling from the high branches of the trees were fair dancing to their own. I joined them, a ballerina twirling and leaping until daddy turned and glared at me. Quiet, he spoke in a loud whisper as he pointed ahead. The tree, the best tree ever, sat in a clearing as if the other trees had stepped back to give her, I knew it was a female tree, room to grow round and full, thick, short needles. She was shorter than the trees, which only made her more appealing, especially to a Christmas tree hunter like my daddy. I pointed to the branches where the snow had settled in clumps. Can't we take her home just like this? Daddy made the sound he always made over my silly ideas. He mumbled under his breath as he circled the tree, leaving large footprints in the snow. I followed, placing my boots into each print. When he stopped, I ran into his back. He turned with a frown. Careful. In one hand was the bow saw. He studied his prize with serious concentration, like a master builder about to choose his first cut. After much chin rubbing and muttering, he squatted for a look. An eternity went by before he cut into the tree's trunk. I heard a sigh of pain, a sadness released into the air. When I told him this, he shook his head. And, he said sternly, you have your head full of dreams. His voice was soft and firm at the same time. He made a clean cut through the trunk, sawing with a speed that caused tiny pieces of wood to fly. I turned my face away and thought instead of the strands of lights and strings of popcorn, I would lace through the branches. In great detail, I described the decorations I would hang on this special tree and the red-headed angel with golden wings that I would place at the top. She protects us, I explained. This comment brought a half smile that smoothed the lines around Daddy's mouth. He trudged off his combat boot tracks at the attack scene. The tree was pulled behind him, clearing a path through the forest that I felt privileged to step into. As we continued our mission, each tree became a hiding place for the enemy, and I instructed Daddy to keep low so their fire wouldn't hit us or damage our prize, our prisoner, the perfect Christmas tree. We snaked our way through the woods one careful step at a time, back into the bright daylight of another world, our world, if only for a while. We tugged the tree, fingers touching through the snow, past the silent, deserted playground, now covered with a blanket of white. The sun rode the sky with little warmth, but still the icicles began to fade, one drip at a time. My feet had gone numb long before the business of dragging the tree. We left our prize by the front door and entered the warm, steamy apartment. The aroma of banana bread reminded me how normal Mother acted now. She looked up from a ball of cookie dough she was rolling cut out sugar cookies, little bowls of green, red, and white sugar sprinkles sat around. When I caught a smile Daddy exchanged with Mother, I knew this was a rare time, a scene that wouldn't last, and I should hold on to its flimsy tail as long as I could. So I particular section to read so that I could show the, the relationship that I had with my father and kind of with my mom, it, while we were in Germany, things were, that was the good time of my part of my life or part of my tr childhood was in when we were in Germany. And to show the difficulty that was uh, taking place with my mother and father at the time. Also, um, my mother was an uh, undiagnosed um, bipolar 
she self-medicated. Of course, back then they didn't call it bipolar. They called it um, manic depressive, but she self-medicated. And so that was an issue that goes, it runs all through the book. The book Roll the Stone Away is about all the women in my family. It's not really a memoir uh, for me. It's a memoir for, for the women in my family. And it shows the flaw, their flaws. It also shows, um, their strengths, because I think they, they go hand in hand. I write, this is the first nonfiction I've ever written. I write novels. I have four novels in the Black Mountain series. And a lot of the stories that my grandmother used to sit around and tell are in those novels, you know, laced throughout. I like to say, well, there's truth laced throughout. I happen to think that fiction is probably the most truthful genre that's there because um, when I write fiction, I, I'm free to write whatever. And a lot of times I will write um, the truth and not even realize how much of the truth I'm writing until the book's finished and I'm looking at edits or even doing interviews. And then I realize, Oh God, I wrote about that. So, <laughs> but um, so it, it, I'm used to approaching the subject matter in the, in these books in this book, in my other books, but not in such a way that says, hey, this is what happened to me, or this is what happened to my mother, or this is what happened to my grandmother, and this is how my father left, and and um, that kind of thing. So the book is um, very dark in a lot of ways, I'm not going to lie, but there's um, also this a strength, I think, and, and a forgiveness and empathy that runs throughout it. So, you know, I think that um, you would enjoy reading it if you did. <laughs> uh, but, um, and, and also I approach, and while I was actually writing this book, I found out a lot of things that I didn't know existed. When I started writing this book, a lot of people asked me how, um, how in the world did you write this and, not hurt people's feelings well they were all dead by the time I wrote this and so it, my brother was the only one left and he um he understood what I was doing he also said that he wouldn't read it because he had truth is fluid and so what my truth is may not be his truth and he, he had lived it and he didn't want and so there was no hard feelings he just didn't want to live through it reading it in the book and that was fine I respected him for that and but I did go to him. He was the only one I really had to go to and say, "This is what I'm doing," and, and he totally agreed that it was something that needed to to be put in print that it would help people. And um, but he did not want to read it. And so good for me. But one of the, a lot of I found out a lot of things about my family re researching. You know, we all think we we have these boring families, but. Um, you know, we have a lot of bones in the closet. That's what I like to, to say. I have a lot of bones in, a, in the closet. And I found out a lot of stuff that took place, uh, you know, in my family and the history that explained a lot of things about who my mother became, who my grandmother was. I found a lot, a lot of shocking stuff from my, um, from about my grandmother, who I believed, you know, always told the truth, don't we all? So, but anyway, uh think I'm running out of time now, but, uh, <laughs> but that's, you know, pretty much hopefully gives you an idea of what the book's about. And thank you. That's, I love that scene. I love the idea of you being able to smell icicles and hear the pain of the, the tree being uh, <laughs> cut down. Uh, so maybe we can get to that uh, in, in the question and answer section. Um, but next let's, let's bring uh, Carter Sickles in and, Carter is or Carter's debut novel, *The Evening Hour*, was an Oregon Book fi Award finalist, a Lambda Literary Award finalist, and was adapted into a feature film. His essays in fiction have appeared in a variety of publications, including *The Atlantic* and *Oxford American*. Carter is the recipient of the 2013 Lambda Literary Emerging Writer Award, and has earned fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Sewanee Writers Conference, and others. He's currently an assistant professor of English at Eastern Kentucky University. Carter? Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Phil, and thank you, Southern Festival of the Books. And uh, it's great to be here with Ian. I really loved what you read. It was such a vivid um, scene and just such great kind of sensory detail and description. So I'll tell you a little bit about my book and then I'm just gonna read a very short um, excerpt from it. So let's, I don't know if you can uh, see this, but this is, yeah, um, my novel, The Prettiest Star. And um, the novel takes place in 1986. And it's about Brian Jackson, a uh, young gay man who's been diagnosed um, with HIV and he has been living in New York since he was um, 18. And um, he decides he, he's lost his friends and his boyfriend um, to AIDS and decides to return to the small town where he grew up in, in Ohio, in Appalachia. Um, and when Brian comes back home, his parents uh, insist on trying to keep his HIV status and his sexuality a secret. And that shame um, and secrecy really begins to weigh on Brian and sort of tear the family apart. Rumors start to spread in the town and, and the family and Brian are harassed. So it's really a book about shame and, and silence and about the kind of the binds and fractures of family and home. Um, as I said, the novel takes place in 86. And so this is one year after Rock Hudson uh, has died of AIDS. And that really brought the news of AIDS into homes across America. Although at that point, thousands of people, um, majority gay men at that time, um, had died and were HIV positive. Um, I think it was not until 1987 when President Reagan actually publicly addressed AIDS. And at that point, 40,000 people in the US had died. So the country's attitude, you know, was very much to turn its back on people with AIDS from the government to churches, the media community um, and families turning away their um, sons. And I think people with AIDS and gay men were viewed by a huge swath of the population as uh, expendable. So my novel is looking at the AIDS crisis of the 80s through this one town and this one family and through the lens of, of rural America. And, um, you know, I think most of the stories we read are taking place in New York or San Francisco about this time period, which makes sense because those communities were so devastated. But some of those men, you know, had to go back to these towns where they grew up for various reasons um, or because they just wanted to go home and they missed um, their families. So I wanted to, to follow one of these men home and, and think about um, that story of the AIDS crisis in rural America that I think has been kind of overlooked. Um, this is Brian's story, but it's very much a story of his family too. And I knew I wanted to step into the other character's shoes. So there are multiple narrators. Um, you hear from Brian, you hear from his mother, Sharon, and his little sister, Jess. And they both have their own secrets and hopes and dreams and their own kind of um, emotional journeys. Uh, I'll read from the book, from Brian's point of view, just a one scene. Um, so this is Brian's story and I wanted him, you know, I wanted to anchor the novel around him. And so he's 24, he's lost his boyfriend and, and many friends to AIDS and he feels pretty uh, isolated. When he was a kid, he was sort of a baseball star, very popular, um, but also felt kind of alone and um, apart. Um, the music of David Bowie spoke to him, which is where the title of the book comes from, one of his songs, and um, became kind of a symbol of freedom for Brian. And he left for New York at 18, and he found community and friendship and love in New York. Um, he is an amateur video artist, uh, so he brings home his video camera and he's recording himself and he uses the camera as a kind of diary. And so that's how his chapters are framed. And these are a way for him to kind of control his own story and to document, um, you know, queer lives. So in this scene I'm gonna read, he's been home um, for a couple of months 
And this is a scene with his grandmother, Letty. And Letty is, is really the only one in the family who I think um, loves him 100% unconditionally and you know, stands up to protect him and, and defend him. So I'll just read this, this scene with them. June 27th, 1986. Today, I was watching TV with my grandmother and Tammy Faye Baker was on, singing about Jesus, and Mama looked at me. Honey, even if you don't go to church, God will listen to your prayers, she says. Good Lord, was she telling me to get right with God? Does she worry I'm heading to hell? Tammy Faye doesn't seem to believe in a punishing kind of God, and I don't think my grandmother does either. As Tammy Faye blinked her mascara-thick lashes, I was reminded of drag queens I knew in New York. I wouldn't mind going to church with Tammy Faye, I said, especially if she'd let me do her makeup. Mamma giggled. Big alligator tears started to run down Tammy Faye's glittery pink cheeks. Oh, there she goes. Anything could set her off, Mamma said. When I was little, on Avon nights, we'd sit at the table and Mamma would make lists of what she'd sold and what she needed to reorder. I'd help organize everything, lining up mascara wands, tubes of lipstick, flat pressed squares of eyeshadow, moisturizer, moisturizer that smelled like flowers, eye cream. I loved the dark green bottles of perfume, the elegant gold cases of rouge. My grandmother didn't care if my hands fluttered. She asked my opinions and trusted my taste. I think Mamma would love to see a drag queen. Sometimes I'd help friends with their makeup, but I only did drag a couple of times myself. I never performed or went out in public, didn't have the nerve or the courage. But still, when I sat in front of a mirror and brushed on blush and eyeshadow, glued on eyelashes, I felt a wild shock of delight. Boys came to me because I had the right touch. A few of them are dead, others sick, others infected. They were thrilled to be wearing makeup and sparkling gowns and wigs and to be free from their father's disappointment and shame. They were so beautiful. And um, I'll just stop there. Um, that gives you a sense of Brian's voice. And like I said, you also get to hear from Jess, his 14 year old sister and from um, Sharon, his mother. Um, yeah, I think I can stop there and then we can open the conversation up. Great. Thank you, Carter. Uh, it's, it's a really striking thing to think about someone's having friends who are all infected, sick or dead, um, you know, and, and at that moment in time, obviously. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do is is ask both of you some questions um, that I have and, and then invite the rest of the folks listening or watching uh, this virtual presentation to send your questions, uh, post them on a, a StreamYard, and we will ask them or I'll ask the, the authors. But let me begin first with Anne. Uh, <laughs> there are quite a few revelations, secrets, and lies that you uncovered about your family during this project. Uh, and I'm curious which one or which ones were the most shocking or surprising for you. Well, well, I think, and I, and nothing I'm going to talk about spoils the book, but <laughs> but uh, I think probably finding out that my grandmother, I, I grew up believing and understanding that this man that visited every Sunday night and brought four quarters, no, eight quarters for me and eight quarters for my brother that we had to put in a bank. <laughs> and his name was Arthur and I knew him as Uncle Arthur and and understood that he was my, my grandmother's brother. And that, uh, I was 20. 21 before she sat me down and said, that's not the case. I've been his mistress since um, she was in her, th in, in not even 30 yet. So that was pretty, that was probably the most shocking thing because I always, I was very close to my grandma. If there was normalcy in, in our family, she was the normal one. And she was the one that didn't judge quite as harshly as, as other people. And, in the family and in the community. So that was the most shocking for me to have found out because I believed everything she 
said. I always believed everything she said, uh, even to go as far as when I was, I'm writing a book for Mercer University Press about um, Lucille Seeley Frank, which is Leo Frank's wife. Leo Frank was hung for the murder of, well, he was actually sentenced to death and then his death, his sentence was commuted. He was a Jewish man. And I'm writing about his wife because somebody needs to write about her. And I sat down with um, Steve Oney, who wrote the Bible on the whole book, uh, uh, on the trial part of it. And uh, I'm telling him something that my grandmother had told me now. And I'm, you know, at that point when I was doing that, I was 60. And I'm still believing every single thing she says. And when I described this particular scene, he said, wait a minute. Your grandmother couldn't have seen it there. She had to have seen it after he was hung. She had to have been taken to, you know, think about it. You've looked at your research. And I had. But because my grandmother said that, it's just like I never, that 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 part of me that always tuned everything out and totally believed because I needed to believe in her. I, you know, as a child, I had to believe everything she said. I had to have one person in the family that I I never picked up on what she was what she was telling me she had to have actually not witnessed it because no one witnessed it but the people that did it but went in afterwards and so that was another very shocking thing to and and feeling so silly when you know you talk to somebody and they have to point it out to you because once again i i believed everything she said so yeah sure. yeah you know, as you're as you're talking about, I was wondering: Are there any? I can't remember. Are there any uncles, uh, in a very general way? Are there any uncles in your in this book who wind up being what you thought they were? <laughs> well, yes, uncles, not uncles, but my great grandfather. Great grandfather. Okay. My, my great grandfather. Um, I, I didn't know much about him, didn't even know where he was buried until I started writing this book and everybody's been dead. And I had, you know, in my research found where he was buried, but um, knew not a lot about him other than my grandmother said that he was a very mean man. You know, right. she had two sentences about him and that was one of them. He was a very mean man. Mm -hmm. When I did research, I, I'm, I found that he had lived in Forsyth County. My grandmother grew up in Forsyth County, Georgia, just north of Atlanta. And she grew up there until she was 10, and then they moved away. But I found out that he was, he was a, um, he cl racially cleaned, helped clean the, the, yeah. And I'm like, uh -huh. he must be rolling over in his grave because <laughs> his great granddaughter is so different and the family is so different and so diverse. We're, you know, my family, my small little part of the family is a very diverse family. And uh, he must have been, you know, very much my grandmother. I, my grandmother was um, raised me and from 10 on and she was very Appalachian and everything she thought and said. And so she would have said, you know, he, <laughs> he was probably going to haunt me for that one because, <laughs> because we were so different. We were so different, but he did help. And racially cleansed Forsyth County, which did not, that didn't ever, didn't end until 1986 when Hosea Williams and, and got Oprah involved and went up to, to there. And it's kind of, began to, then there's some people, you know, that will not still not go through there. I'm not comfortable going there. I'll be, mm -hmm. There's parts of it that's totally different, but where my grandmother grew up, still has some of the old buildings left it's still the same and it's a very toxic place and i'm sensitive to that i feel that way and there's probably people out there from forsyth county that's getting mad at me but but you know it's just how i feel it's how i feel yeah. yep <laughs> well carter let me ask you uh you you tell this this novel through multiple voices um and i'm, I'm curious about a couple things first uh, why why you chose that structure and then and then uh, maybe a much smaller uh question but you know why no why no letty voice mm -hmm. why no letty chapter yeah i mean i've always kind of been drawn to novels that use that uh, multiple narrators you know because i think it's a way that you can tell the story 
through these different angles, through different characters, perspectives. Um, and then you learn kind of a larger story about the, the community, about the family. Um, I wanted Brian's voice to be at the center. Like I, I, that was really important to me, but it is a story about how his family, um, you know, in different ways tries to hide him, um, but also their love for him. So it felt important to have, you know, Jess, uh, his sister and his mother um, get to have their own chapters. And it was also kind of a way to show just like the levels of secrecy that I think would have been sort of hard to do only from Brian's um, perspective and to show how they're grappling with it and the mistakes that they make and the flaws that they have. Um, and, you know, we'd mentioned earlier uh, before this started that as I lay dying, you know, was an influence on me. Um, I had was already working on this book and I'd read it before, but I was rereading it to teach it. And I just kept thinking about um, the family members in Faulkner, how they're this family, but they're all sort of so isolated from each other and kind of thinking about that and constructing this. And, um, and as far as Letty, I mean, I did write from her point of view kind of on my own. I do a lot of character work to sort of figure out like who these people are. So I certainly wrote some sections from her perspective, but you know, in some ways she, her function or her role is sort of the family member who loves Brian and defends him and supports him. And I think that you can show, I could show all of that through the other characters' perspectives. Um, you know, she felt so, uh, strongly about her views and about Brian um, that I don't think there was as much sort of um, character kind of inner conflict that came up with the other characters. You know? but. Let me ask you one, a follow-up question and that makes a lot of sense about, about Letty. So one thing that you decided to do was obviously to uh, give Brian a, a video diary rather than a diary. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just, wondering, I mean, as I was reading through it, I was, I was wondering, is that choice, did you make that choice because it allows those two communities in a sense to see each other differently? I mean, both mm -hmm. through Brian's eyes or, or, or was that just simply a, you know, a different, a different way for Brian to see? That's a great question. I mean, I like that idea that, yeah, I've seen um, him differently through that camera lens. Um, you know, I actually had started out with a, an actual diary, sort of he was keeping a journal and it just wasn't quite working. It was early on and I was still learning about his character. And, you know, he lived uh, in the East Village in New York City, which was becoming such a vibrant place um, for art and visual art um, during the eighties and a lot of queer artists that I felt like he would have brushed up against. Plus the video camera was becoming really popular um, in kind of the mid eighties. So it worked really well to think of him kind of with this camera um, as, as a way to sort of document his life because I think a lot of queer people were doing that at that time because um, they were sort of being ignored or erased, you know, by a larger society. So, um, and I, I did want to kind of set his parts um, apart, you know, to frame them differently than the rest of the book. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. And, and as I said to y'all backstage, I, I was, I grew up in midtown Manhattan in the middle of the eight or in the early eighties. And there were, there were a lot of famous characters uh, who yeah. made, made a living out of walking around with a, with a video camera and then doing, you know, ac uh, cable access uh, mm. shows uh, that, but uh, anyways, it's, it's a really yeah. interesting, um, uh, it, decision and device. I uh, want to encourage again, audience members, uh, please send your your questions um, to, uh, to us through StreamYard and I'll ask our authors. But in the meantime, I want to ask Anne, uh, it seems to me that memory in your, in your book is something that's very, um, I, it, you just said truth is fluid earlier and that memories are fluid and that uh, they may be intentionally and sometimes unintentionally are changed to, to suit the narrative that someone 
needs about his or her life. As you were working through this, did you have you know specific ideas you wanted to uh, lay out about the unstable nature of remembering and memories? I don't think it was a conscious, you know, a addressing memories, but it became just like in my novels, there'll be a, something that is reoccurring. So in the 50th draft, I, I went and looked and thought, you know, this is the, the memories, especially with my grandmother, my grandmother's memories were, um, interesting and, and understandable in a lot of ways. And there's a case where um, her, her my great grandfather, which I did not know, I'd heard the story that her mother, when her mother died, she died when my grandmother was almost six. She got out of the car. They had a Model T. They were the only ones in the, in the town that had a Model T because my grandmother's um, my great grandmother's family had a lot of money and they bought them a model T when they got married. And so they had gone to get shoes for my grandmother and she went to step out of the car her boot caught on the running board and she fell backwards and cracked her head on the curb and everything was fine. And she got up and she, you know, got back in the car. They went, they went, got shoes. They did everything they had to do. And the next day she was missing from the, the, the kitchen and she was in bed. It's sick. And so my grandmother thought immediately, Oh, there's another baby coming because the only time mother's not in here, you know, and she did not want that to happen because she was getting older. And so she'd have to look after the young ones. Right. At that point, there was only one younger than her. And, um, but her, but my, great grandmother had cracked her skull and and uh this the story was in my grandmother's memory she, she never told this part but the story was that her whole head turned black which a doctor wouldn't have said that. i mean it probably didn't all turn black but that's the perception of it was that because she had cracked her skull and she was bleeding and she died so that was the story then I find out later that that's not the story at all, that my grandmother had witnessed them fighting in the car. He pushed her out. She, she had the baby on her lap, which was the youngest, and went out of the car too. And that's how she had hurt her head, cracked her head. And, and that's when the punishment of the, because, you know, nobody, I went through all of these newspapers looking and nothing. And that's because they took care of their own and they took care of what was going to happen. And they, that's what they did with him. So it kind of circled around. He, you know, he got rid of, of, of a lot of African-Americans and turned, they turned around and used the same things that he helped use on him to get him out of there because he had killed his wife, but he never did a day in jail. So those are the kind, and my grandmother's memory she didn't want it. I mean, she didn't want anybody to know that she was ashamed. There's a lot of shame and secrets. And she, so she would just tell the story about her tripping and falling and hitting her head, but she was old enough to have seen it. And I'm sure she just told herself that to the point where she believed it, you know, and haven't we met people that have done that? I mean, it blows me away. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's such a powerful uh, part of the book to, to realize how she has shifted that uh, and how it has an effect, um, you know, uh, long, long term down, down the years. Exactly. Uh, and, I, and I guess, Carter, and, and in your, in your case, in the, in the novel for, for Brian, for, uh, for Sharon in particular, uh, maybe Travis to a lesser degree, uh, is there, how does memory work for them? Because it seems like you're you're playing a lot with what something was prior to the moment that we're seeing them as, I don't know, something that each of them is yearning for, each of them wants to change. Like I think Travis and Sharon talk about, Travis said, we, sh we should have intervened then mm -hmm. to like fix Brian. H how does memory in your mind work in this in this novel? Yeah, I mean, I think that there is this, um, you know, especially with 
with Sharon and Travis, the parents, it's like this idealized memory of what their lives were like um, before and what and uh, who their son was. And then now that their son is home and in their house there with them after being gone for six years, it's like they're missing all these opportunities or refusing these opportunities to really get to know him and who he is and, and um, take care of him. So in some ways, I think that their memories um, are, I don't know, sort of an excuse, a way for them to not engage with the real person kind of sitting in front of them in their living room. Um, but yeah, I think those memories, and of course, Brian's own memories of being a kid and, and what that looked like. And and he did have this like love of for his family, um, but he also felt very disconnected even then, right? So it wasn't this sort of perfect um, childhood that they're sort of like memory, remembering or reimagining. And then he has all his memories of New York too that are kind of layered in the novel um, as well. But it's, you know, I do think, um, I mean, obviously they're very, very different books, but I think both are dealing with kind of, as Anne was talking about, not just secrets, but the shame, you yeah. know, and how shame affects um, relationships and dynamics between the characters and, and the silence. I think yeah. um, the, the silence secrets. is the secrets. Yeah, and that's that's powerful. I think in 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 both your books, and you know, I I, I have three sons, and uh, the youngest is is a senior in high school, and you know, there are just moments where Travis is almost he's unreadable for me because it's so painful to think of what he is mm -hmm. unable to say, how much shame he feels, and what he is the opportunity is losing. Uh, but uh, let me let me go to a question that we have here, and and this is for both of you, and we'll we'll start, I guess, with Carter on this one. Um, are there certain authors that you find yourself turning back to repeatedly in your life? It's mm, a good question. I mean, I mentioned Faulkner, and I do go back to Faulkner quite a bit, um, just because of uh, the density of you know one book. It's like biblical in a way, which is so many layers, right? Um, and, and what he's just sort of doing with language and thinking about also secrets and um, shame and families and, 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 and kind of unearthing those secrets. But um, James Baldwin is a huge hero of mine. I go mm. back to his work often. Um, I'm actually getting ready to read Giovanni's Room again, because I think I'm gonna teach that next semester. Um, but, you know, I think he was so, I mean, he was articulating um, discussions about race um, and queerness that were just so incredible for that time, you know? I mean, I feel like he was such a visionary. And um, and then I think Dorothy Allison has always been a hero of mine, you know, because she too writes about um, kind of the darker stuff and the, the stuff that people don't always wanna talk about, you know, the harder stories. Those are a few. But that's a great question. Yeah. Anne, how about you? Well, it's hard because I have a lot. Um, Toni Morrison is one of my all time. I will reread her books over and over. Beloved, I've read so many times. And it changed, it learned something new each time I read it. So, Toni Morrison, um, I love Ellen Gilchrist, which is a Southern writer. And I love, it's very contemporary. It, contemporary and but I love her characters are so flawed and 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 I just love her too um Lee Smith of course you know and Ron Rash you know I I just can't even imagine not rereading his books and so I love him that's just a you know I could go on and on and then Te <laughs> and Natasha Trethway as far as poet goes mm -hmm. I love her poetry Oh, that's great. Yeah, the I, I, there was as you were saying, Lee Smith. I was thinking I would love to see the the women from Fair and Tender Ladies meet your family, your the women in your your family, and see what that conversation would be like. Uh, but we are we are just about at the end of our time, and I want to thank uh, Ann Height and Carter Sickles for for not just for being a part of this. So I appreciate that for for writing two really really important books, um, and they are in different ways courageous books. And I'm I'm glad that you gave 
uh, the world the stories that need to be told. And uh, I want to ask that folks watching who haven't purchased them, please do. Um, they are tremendous reads and you will be glad you read them. Um, you can find uh, these books at the Parnassus Books online festival store. And that's at www.parnassusbooks.net backslash backslash SFB. And to all of you who have joined us for this session, thanks so much. Have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.